Hello and welcome to the University of Alberta's Opening Up Copyright Instructional Module on the Educational Institution Exceptions of the Copyright Act. The Copyright Act outlines certain circumstances where users can copy or use copyright protected works without infringing on the rights of the copyright owners. Section 29.4 to Section 30.03 of the Act describe the exceptions to infringement that apply specifically to educational institutions and staff. That said, it is critical for people who work in education to understand that in addition to these exceptions, they can also rely on the fair dealing exception, discussed further in other modules. In most cases, it is better to look at the fair dealing exceptions first, as they provide more flexibility than the exceptions we will be discussing here. The exceptions that apply specifically to educational institutions or people acting under their authority can be a little bewildering, to be honest. So let's go through them in order, starting with displaying works in classrooms. It is not infringing copyright to copy a work or take any other necessary action in order to display it in a classroom. But this has to be done for educational purposes and can only be displayed on school premises. Sounds great, right? Except there is a limitation which is that the materials reproduced for use in the classroom cannot be reasonably commercially available in a suitable format for the intended use. So, it is okay for you to make a copy of something in order to display it in your classroom, as long as it's not reasonably possible for you to buy a copy in the right format for you to display it in your classroom. Although, arguably, this hinges on what you consider reasonable. You can also reproduce things in order to include them in exams, but again, only if that thing is not commercially available in the appropriate medium. Section 29.5 covers certain public performances of things like plays or music in educational institutions. This is allowed as long as it is held on the premises of the institution, the audience is composed primarily of students and educators, and the performance is done primarily by students. Similarly, Educational institutions can play sounds, films, or broadcasts made by others as long as the audience is primarily composed of students and educators, and the copy was acquired in a way that is not infringing copyright. This exception makes it possible for teachers to include a variety of different kinds of works and media into their lessons. Teachers can also make a single copy of a broadcast for use in the classroom. If the recording is of a news program, it can be kept for subsequent classroom use. But if the copy is of a documentary or of a non-news broadcast, the copy must either be destroyed or royalties must be paid after 30 days. So if you're a teacher or instructor and you see a documentary that might be useful in a few months or next semester, I guess you don't bother recording it. Or consider whether you might be able to rely on fair dealing. If you thought that was useful, just consider some of the Section 30 exceptions. It is not infringing copyright to use materials in a telecommunication in order to deliver a lesson, test, or examination to students who are enrolled in a course, even if they are not physically on the school premises. You can also make a fixation, such as a screen recording, of that telecommunication or do any other action that is necessary. A student can also make a reproduction of it in order to listen to or view the lesson at a more convenient time. Both the students and the educators are required to destroy a reproduction within 30 days after students receive their final course evaluations for the class that the lesson was a part of. This is a controversial condition because educators would usually want to encourage students to revisit their training and lessons in the future. Not only that, but institutions and teachers don't usually have the time or money to go through all the trouble of preparing a lesson only to destroy it at the end of term. It is also unclear how these rules would be enforced. For distance education or online learning, it is perhaps better to reference the educational institution's fair dealing guidelines and rely on those instead. Having students and teachers destroy their lessons after courses are over kind of undermines the whole goal of education as Section 3002 attempts to explain, we think, as there is no case law on this at this point, it is also not an infringement of copyright to make a digital reproduction of a reprographic reproduction in order to include it in a telecommunication of a lesson as long as you have a reprographic reproduction license with the collective licensing agency. Did we lose you? Yeah, honestly, I think I lost myself, so no worries. Essentially, 
If you have entered into a specific digital reproduction license agreement with a collective, you must follow those terms and conditions when making a digital reproduction or copy. Otherwise, you can comply with the license terms and conditions applicable in your reprographic reproduction license to the extent that they are reasonably applicable to a digital reproduction. If an institution has been paying royalties to a collective voluntarily under an interim tariff, and then that institution enters into a digital reproduction license agreement with the collective, or if a tariff that applies to the digital copies being made is approved at a new royalty rate, there may be a difference in the amount of royalties that the institution owes the collective for digital copies going forward. Yeah, when we said these exceptions were bewildering, we were not kidding. Have we mentioned the fair dealing exceptions? Those exceptions are looking pretty good right about now. Now let's talk about Pam. Not Professor Pam, who you might recognize from other modules, but the publicly available materials on the internet provision in the Copyright Act. As section 3004 states, if something is available through common uses of the internet, it is not an infringement for that thing to be reproduced, communicated through telecommunication, or performed for educational or training purposes. This is not the case if it has been protected by a Technological Protection Measure, or TPM, or if the owner explicitly posts otherwise. It is important to remember that reproducing for educational purposes does not mean distributing on the open web. A common interpretation of the condition of this section is to make these resources available in a restricted environment, like an online portal that requires student and staff authentication to access. These educational exceptions did not come up at all during the INDU Committee's statutory review of the Copyright Act in 2019. This might speak to the fact that these exceptions are not relied on very often, and are thus not as relevant as the fair dealing exception. However, we like to think that the second recommendation, which calls for the wording of the act to be simplified, may be useful for these sections. You should now be able to understand the educational exceptions in section 29.4 to section 30.03 of the Copyright Act, that is, if anyone can understand these exceptions, describe the publicly available materials on the internet exception, whatever that is, and recognize that the use of copyright protected materials for educational purposes might also fall under the fair dealing exception, and that educators need not always rely on section 29.4 to section 30.03. Basically what we're saying is just, you know, don't watch this module again or anything. Just rely on fair dealing or try to find OER. This has been the University of Alberta's opening up copyright instructional module on the educational institution exceptions in the Copyright Act. Thank you for your attention.